Great day to everyone. This is your professor, Dr. Benjamin Cabrera, again with my new video, which is intended for my uh, students in pediatrics. Okay, have a great day to all. And today we'll be discussing about the Integrated Management of Childhood Illnesses, or IMCI, which all has been taken from the PDF file from the World Health Organization. So this lecture is the first of the two series. This is your IMCI 1, which deals with a sick child 2 months to 5 years of age. So let's proceed. Here are the objectives for this uh, lecture. First is to learn how to manage sick infants and children 2 months old up to 5 years of age. And to assess signs and symptoms of illnesses, nutritional vitamin supplementation and immunization status. To identify treatments of the child's classification and deciding if a child needs to be referred. The third would be giving important pre-referral treatments and referring the child. The fourth objective is to provide treatments in the health center such as oral rehydration therapy, vitamin A, and supplementation and immunization. The fifth would be to teach the mother to give specific treatment at home such as oral antibiotics or anti-malarial drugs and to, to learn how to counsel the mother about feeding care for development and when to follow up or return. And the last would be, uh, we will learn here how to reassess the problem and provide appropriate care when a child comes for the scheduled follow-up. Okay, let's uh, start with the principles of your IMCI or in principles of the Integrated Clinical Case Management. IMCI uh, clinical guidelines are based on the following principles. Okay. Examining all sick children up to 5 years of age for the general danger signs. So this is very important. We always look for the danger signs and all young infants for signs of very severe disease. These signs indicate severe illness and the need for immediate referral or admission to the hospital. So the setting is in a, in a local health center. It can be in a barangay health center, village center or anywhere that you go out of the hospital. Okay. The children and infants are seen and assessed for main symptoms. These are the main symptoms. In older children, the main symptoms would include the following. Cough or difficulty of breathing, diarrhea, fever and ear infection, and in young infants, the main symptoms would include the presence of local bacterial infection, diarrhea, and jaundice. And the fourth principle is that only a limited number of clinical signs are used, selected on the basis of their sensitivity and specificity to detect disease through classification. A combination of individual signs leads to a child's classification. Remember that within one or more symptom groups, rather than a diagnosis, the classification of illness is based on a color-coded triad system. So, these are the colors. Remember, pink, yellow, and green. Pink, though it's a feminine color and it's a beautiful color, but this is a color that needs an urgent hospital referral or admission. Yellow means it will indicate initiation of a specific outpatient treatment. So yellow is still outpatient. And green means we just give supportive home care. The IMCI management procedures use a limited number of essential drugs and encourage active participation of caregivers in the treatment of their children. So this entails first 
you will only be using limited number of drugs then another important part of this is the active participation of caregivers in the treatment of their children and here is the last uh, principle for your integrated clinical case management this an essential component of IMCI is to counsel the caregivers regarding home care if ever you'll be sending the patient home as an outpatient case you must counsel the parents or the caregivers regarding appropriate feeding and fluids if the case has an urgent level or pink you must counsel the patient the caregivers when to return to the clinic immediately or when to uh, bring the patient to the hospital and when you have a home treatment or a green case when to return for follow-up So in a child, two months to five years, these are the six steps to be done, okay? There are six steps and one additional step. First is recognizing the danger signs. So what are the danger signs? Then you assess the child and classify the child based on this symptomatology. First, assess and classify the patient as to cough. Then if the patient presents with diarrhea, the patient's presence with fever and assess and classify if the patient presents with an ear problem and the last step would be to assess and classify in the case of malnutrition and anemia and here's the seventh step which is just added is to update immunization which is quite as important as the first six because it entails prevention of problems in the future part one we recognize the danger signs so this is the pink uh, color so it means there's urgency then ask the mother when the child uh, is brought to your clinic ask the mother what's the child's problem are and check for the following danger signs note of the following danger signs these are is the child unable to drink so there are four is the child vomits everything has the child presented with seizure or convulsion is the child abnormally sleepy or difficult to awaken so these are the four danger signs that should be looked for immediately because this the presence of any of the danger signs means a referral to a hospital facility now we assess the, the child as to cough or difficulty of breathing so when the child presents with cough or difficulty of breathing you assess and ask the following assess it as how long or the duration of the cough or difficulty of breathing has been then would you label the breathing once you count it as fast breathing or tachypnea first for these are the ranges so for for two months to one year of age you label that case as a fast breathing or tachypnea if the breath is more than 50 breaths per minute for one to five years of age it will be more than 40 breaths per minute and check for chest improving so you you should always examine the child uh, remove the upper garment of the child or upper shirt and look first observe how how the, is the child breathing the, is it the child comfortable or is the child showing signs of distress like your chest in drawing it means that the lower chest goes in when the child breathes out and last would be the presence of stridor in a calm child a strider is a harsh noise a har harsh noise when the child breathes in
So, to continue, so these are the four cl classes, uh, class, uh, three classification, pink, yellow, or green. The case is classified as pink or argent and for referral, okay? Yellow is a classification means the child needs to needs and be given anti antibiotic uh, treatment or oral anti malaria other treatment and green a classification means the child does not need specific medical treatment such as antibiotic it only means that the child would need supportive care so here are the three possible classifications for a child with cough or difficult of breathing pink one would be severe pneumonia or a very severe disease the yellow one would be pneumonia and the green one would be no pneumonia or just the presence of simple cough or colds so so we progress on and let's see in every color code in pink any danger signs or in drawing or strider in a calm child so to keep niya just in drawing or strider in a calm child so you can refer that as a severe pneumonia if ever the child presents with seizure then that becomes a very severe disease so in the clinic, you can give the first dose of antibiotics. So what this is what you should do. Give vitamin A and prevent hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Then after doing all of this, you refer the patient urgently to a hospital. If ever you just diagnose the case of as pneumonia, meaning it just does tachypnea or fast breathing, what you should do is to give appropriate antibiotics to be given for five days. May, you may give soothing uh, medications for the throat and may relieve the cough with a safe cough remedy and advise the mother to follow up in two days. And of course, you advise them regarding the danger signs. So when uh, danger signs if ever the patient will later on present with severe pneumonia or very severe disease however if you don't see fast breathing and it's just a case case of a simple cough and cold you label that as a non-pneumonia means no sign of pneumonia or very severe disease it just means that if the child has been coughing for more than 30 days, okay, so what would that be? Look, maybe it's an allergic type of condition. Maybe it's an asthma. Soot the throat and relieve the cough with a safe remedy and advise the mother to return and follow up in five days if not improving. So you might give her uh, some uh, expectorant or mucolytics or even a bronchodilator. Note, in its classification table, a child receives only one classification. If ever, okay, here, there's a point of uh, decision. If the child has signs for more than one row, meaning it can be a severe or not severe or just no pneumonia, if ever the child will have symptoms that encompasses two or more rows always select the more serious classification always select the most serious classification then after the cuff we assess the child and classify us to diarrhea okay when the child comes in, you ask what's your problem, mommy, and then and the child, mommy says, yes, the child has been having loose tools, okay, for quite a while, so now you assess and ask how long has the child been suffering from diarrhea, and of 
And the second question would be, is there blood in the stool to determine if the child has dysentery? Okay. Or a, a note for signs of dehydration. You will know the signs of dehydration. Okay. Here. Okay. If the child has diarrhea for 14 days or more, you classify the child as having persistent diarrhea. So, this is more than 14 days or more. Okay? If the child has blood in the stool, you classify the child as a case of dysentery. Okay? Here is the danger signs. Okay? You classify the child as having a danger sign if the child presents with two of the following signs, meaning two, okay, of the following, okay, abnormally sleepy or difficult to awaken, sunken eyes, not able to drink or drinks poorly, and skin pinch goes back very slowly. So these are, there are four danger signs. And you need two out of these four so that you can classify the child as having a, a pink classification. The diagnosis would be severe dehydration. Okay, again, abnormally sleepy, so consciousness and difficult to awake. Look at the eyes, sunken eyes or sunken eyeballs. As usually, the parents will ask you, what do you think, doctor? And you should ask, tell them, uh, how do you classify your child's eye? Because maybe this is my first time to see your child, and I just don't know if your child is, is deep-eyed. Uh, deep okay, so the, the parents should answer that. Or if the parents would complain that she is not able is sleeping a lot and drinking uh, poorly or is not able to drink okay and when you do your skin pinch in the abdomen okay if the skin pinch goes back very slowly more than five seconds then you classify the child as suffering from severe dehydration this is a pink case now for the yellow and green case two of the following signs for yellow would be needed to be classified in the yellow. First, the child is restless and irritable. The child keeps on crying. Okay? And look at the presence of tears. Okay? Restless and irritable doesn't like to drink. Or, next, drinks eagerly or very thirsty. The child grabs the, the, the fluid, ORS, or water, or juice, okay? and has sunken eyes. And again, skin pinch goes back slowly. Okay? Two of the following four signs should be okay, fulfilled and you label it as some dehydration. Well, for the most benign part is no dehydration. It means not enough sign to classify as some or severe dehydration. Now, for the management, for the pink cases, okay, for severe dehydration, we give the treatment plan C, okay? What is treatment plan C? Is if ever it is available, you start your fluids immediately. However, if the child can drink or can, can tolerate oral uh, rehydration, you give ORS by mouth while, while you are setting up the IV if ever it is present in your setup and give okay, this one 100 ml per kilo of your plain LR or NSS and you divide it as to the following. First, for infants less than 12 months, you give 30 ml per kilo per hour then the next would be 70 ml per kilo in per in five hours so you divide it in five hours okay so you have a, like a 10 cc per kilo okay then 
30 ml per kilo in hour, then you give the next dose would be 70 ml per kilo in 5 hours. For children more than 12 months to 5 years old, you can do it faster, like you give your 30 ml per kilo in 30 minutes, then the remaining you give 70 ml per kilo in two and a half hours. So it's uh, 12 to 5 years old means it is twice faster than your 12 to uh, less than 12 months old. Then, always, this is very important, is monitoring. You assess the child every one to two hours because this is a severe dehydration case. Then, if ever, you can give ORS as soon as the child can drink at the range of 5 ml per kilo per hour. Then, they assess the infant after 6 hours and the child after 3 hours. You classify, then you reclassify again for the state of dehydration. If ever, okay, and you have the, the facility, you can give ORS through NGT. So you insert a nasogastric tube, then you give your ORS at 20 cc per hour for 6 hours. Okay? In a total of 100 cc, 120 cc per kilo that is run in 6 hours. So let's proceed. For the treatment or treatment plan B for some dehydration, so this is a beautiful, beautiful representation, and this uh, age group is divided. So as with the weight and how, what is the volume to be given? So you give your oral rehydrating solution during the first four hours, for two to four months, which uh, the the infant may weigh less than six kilograms. You give 200 to 400 ml in the first four hours for 4 to 12 months old which weighs 6 to 10 kilograms you can give 400 to 700 ml in the first four hours for a year and two years old who usually weighs 10 to 12 kilograms you can give 700 to 900 ml of your ORS during the first four hours and last would be your 2 to 5 years old who usually weighs 12 to 19 kilograms you may give them 900 to 1500 ml of ORS during the first 4 hours however if the child wants more ORS extension then give more okay so there is no overdose okay just the the minimum amount okay for children less than 6 months who are not breastfed also give additional 100 to 200 ml of clean water during this period okay you may give small sips from a cup okay however these usually are the cases it is quite common when you give an ors the child will vomit so what you do so just uh, clean the vomit then wait for 10 minutes then re resume uh, the, the oral rehydration but this time slowly okay then uh, continue breastfeeding whenever the child wants still it doesn't matter you still give the above minimum volume then reassess and classify the child after four hours so this is what you do in those yellow cases so with some dehydration you use your treatment plan and now let's proceed to the most benign case of diarrhea, that would be the uh, to be labeled on the green part. Okay, uh, what we do is to treat the diarrhea at home. That would be until treatment plan A. In treatment plan A, give extra fluid as much as the child can take. There is no overdose. Tell the mother if the, she is breastfeeding to breastfeed frequently and for longer period of each feed. If the child is exclusively breastfed, uh, give ORS or clean water in addition to breast milk. And if not breastfed, give one or more of the following oral rehydrating solution, 
food-based fluids like your soup, rice water, or buku juice, or even clean water. If the child is up to 2 years old, you can give the place around 50 to 100 ml of each of the loose stool, so that's volume per volume replacement. If two or more, you can replace each loose stool with 100 to 200 ml of fluids. Then you can give uh, frequent sips from a, from a cup. If ever, this always happens, if the child vomits, so just be, uh, just relax and be calm. Just wait for 10 minutes, then continue, but now more slowly. Then continue giving extra fluids until the diet. So for cases of cholera, the first line of antibiotics is tetracycline, given four times a day for three days, or the second line would be cotrimoxazole or your trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole, given twice a day for three days, for two months to twelve months old or one year, you can give a half of the adult tablet or five ml suspension, given twice a day. Where, and for those 12 months to 5 years old, you can give 1 tap or 10 ml suspension uh, twice a day for 3 days. Then, we can classify diarrhea as in relation to the duration. So, classify persistent diarrhea. If there is dehydration present in the pink row, that would be severe persistent diarrhea. So your primary goal is to treat the dehydration before referral unless this child has another civil classification before you, uh, sending the child to the hospital, you can, you can give vitamin A. Or the case could be a no dehydration case, a green uh, row that would be just be labeled as persistent diarrhea. You just advise mother on feeding and give vitamin A, then uh, ask them to follow up after five days. If ever there will be blood in the stools, so that will be labeled as dysentery. Okay. You treat the, the case for five days with an oral antibiotics, then you ask them to follow up. Our first line of antibiotics for dysentery would be cotrimoxazole at twice a day for five days. And the second line would be nalidixic acid four times a day for five days. For Shigella, causes around 60% of dysentery cases, which are usually seen in the health center. So Shigella can cause 60% of dysentery cases. Then assess and classify now. So we now proceed to fever. So from diarrhea, from cough, then diarrhea, then we go to fever. Okay. A child has the main symptom of fever if the child has history of fever or the child feels hot or the child has an axillary temperature of more than 37.5. A child with fever may have malaria, especially those in malaria-prone areas. Measles, okay, remember you should have high grade fever with a thesis, coriza, conjunctivitis, and cough or other severe disease. Or it, the child may just be suffering from simple cough or cold or other viral infections. Okay, especially now, fever, you should always be uh, very good with your history because among, aside from measles in our setting, in our city, dengue is also a considered. Okay, so you assess that how then when presented with a case of fever, you ask the patient or the caregiver how long the child has been in having fever. As for the history of measles, because you know Measles has, is, is only um, a child can only suffer measles once in a lifetime. Then find out if the child is suffering from stiff neck or having runny nose. 
Okay, so this is the signs suggesting measles, which are general rash and one of these three C's cough, coriza, runny nose, and conjunctivitis or red eyes with fever. Okay, if the child has measles now or within the last three months, assess for signs of measles complication. Okay, like mouth ulcers, pus from the eyes, and clouding of cornea. Okay? Does the child have fever by history? Feel sutter at 37.5 degrees centigrade. Okay. So you classify them. Decide if there's the risk for malaria. Is if you are in a malaria risk area. And ask, does the child live in malaria area? Has the child visited or traveled or stayed overnight in a malaria area in the past four weeks? If yes, obtain a blood smear. Then ask, how long has the child has fever? If more than seven days that the child has been having fever, has the fever been present every day? Has the child had measles within the last three months? So these are your questions. Then look and feel. Look for and feel for stiff neck. Look for the runny nose. Look for signs of measles like your fever and thesis, generalized rash, maculopapillar, and none of these cough, runny nose, or red. The child has measles now or within the last three months, what you do do? Look for mouth ulcers. Are they deep and extensive? Look for pus draining from the eyes and look for clouding of the cornea. And you classify measles. So the, the measles is also classified into three, the three categories, the pink, the yellow, and the green. Okay, so for the pink uh, row, any danger signs of clouding of cornea, deep extensive mouth ulcers, now you can label the case as a severe complicated measles. If ever there will be pus staining from the eyes or just mouth ulcer, you can label the case as a measles with eye or mouth complication. And if ever in the history just had measles now or within the last three months without any complication, you can label the child as only measles and it will be advised home remedies. So treatment for severe complicated measles, first you give uh, vitamin A and there's a range and there's a dose, okay? At 6 to 12 months, you can give 100,000 units, okay? And at 12 months to 5 years old, you can give 200,000. So meaning at 0 to 6 months, you can give 50,000. Give the first dose of an appropriate antibiotic if needed. If clouding of cornea or pus draining from the eye, apply a tetracycline eye ointment, then urgently refer to a hospital. For cases on the yellow row, measles with eye or mouth complication, you give your vitamin A. If there's a pus draining from the eye, apply tetracycline eye ointment. If mouth ulcer, you can treat it with gentian violet. And ask the patient to, to follow up in two days. If ever it's just a case of measles, you can give, just give vitamin A. So you assess all children with fever, assess for dengue hemorrhagic fever, assess for signs of dengue hemorrhagic fever. Is there, ask if there will be bleeding from the nose or gums. Could there be, patient be vomiting with diarrhea or stools? Can, could it be black vomitus or black stools? Or could there be petechia in the skin you observe and you look for it? Or is there a sign of shock like hot gum extremities with slow capillary refill? Or would there be persistent abdominal pain or persistent vomiting? Then, if all of these are negative in a child 6 months or more with fever, then perform a tourniquet test. And I hope you know how to perform a tourniquet So, 
If ever you will be suspecting dengue fever, you ask, has the child has any bleeding from the nose or gums or in the vomitus or stool? Has the child has black vomitus or has the child has black stool? Has the child has persistent abdominal pain or has the child been having persistent vomiting? Then, what? Look and feel. Look for bleedings from the nose or gums. Look for the skin petechiae. Feel for cold and clammy extremities. Check for slow capillary refill. And if none of the above, as look and feel signs are present, the child is more than six months and fever present for more than three days. Then perform a tourniquet test. So Dengue can be labeled into the severe form, okay, like a pink row, if ever this one, if ever you'll be seeing this one, like bleeding from the nose or gums, bleeding in the stool or vomitus, presence of PTK, cold clam extremities, or capillary refill of more than 3 seconds, or the patient is suffering from persistent abdominal pain, or is having persistent vomiting. And has a positive tourniquet test. Then you can label the case as a severe dengue hemorrhagic fever. If ever there's no sign of severe dengue and even dengue hemorrhagic fever, then you can label the case as fever only, no dengue hemorrhagic fever unlikely. Okay. If ever, again, in connection to fever, there will be uh, in the malaria risk area. Beside the malaria risk, if there's malaria, take the blood smear. So these are the category of provinces. Category A, provinces with no significant improvement in malaria situation would be your Kalinga, Mountain Province, Sifigao, Cagayan, Isabela, Mindoro, Palawan, Quezon, Zambales, Davao, and Compostela Valley. For Category B, provinces where situation improved in 5 years, Abra, Pangasinan, Ilocos, Southern Tagalog, Cotabato, Rizal, NCR, including Antipolo, San Andal Monte, Arikina, and Fairview. Okay, you classify fever, like according to malaria, malarial risk, yes, any danger signs of, these are the danger signs, stiff neck, if ever there will be blood smear positive, or if the plasma, blood smears will not be done, look for runny nose and no measles and no other cause of fever, okay, so just label it as Mal just malaria but if there will be de general danger signs you can le uh, label this as very severe fever disease or malaria if uh, blood smell would be negative then just label it as fever with malaria unlikely now if ever you'll be labeling a case of severe malaria or very severe febrile disease or malaria you can give that would be on the pink row give first dose of your quinine give the first dose of appropriate antibiotic treat the child to prevent low blood sugar so you always have to prevent hypoglycemia give one dose of paracetamol then send a blood smear with the patient and refer urgently to a hospital for those just suffering from malaria without complications, you treat the child with all our anti-malarial, give one dose of paracetamol, advise the mother when to return and usefully ask, ask them to follow up in two days if fever persists. If fever is more than seven days, you refer for assessment. If ever, uh, there will be no signs of malaria, negative blood smear, fever, and malaria unlikely. Just give one dose of paracetamol. Advise the mother when to return and treat the other cause of fever. Okay. However, if you are living in a low-risk malaria area, but your patient will manifest 
danger signs for malaria like stiff neck or any other general danger signs. Then you can label the case as a very severe disease, fever disease, and then will be placed in the pink row. Then you give the first dose of appropriate antibiotics if ever you'll be considering bacterial infection. If the child with low blood sugar, you treat it. Okay, you treat it and prevent hypoglycemia. If one dose of paracetamol, then refer immediately to the hospital. If ever the case will be on the green row, there will be no signs of very severe fever disease or fever, no malaria. Just give one dose of your paracetamol, advise the mother to return. Follow up in two days if fever persists. If fever is present for more than seven days, you refer the case for assessment and otherwise look for other causes of fever and treatment. Then, assess and classify for ear infection. So, a child will come to you with an ear problem, then assess for ear pain, the presence of ear pain. Look for discharge. If the discharge is present, how long has the discharge has been? And look if there will be tendril swelling behind the ear or sign of mastoid. So, to classify the ear problem, then there's swelling between the, behind the ear, that could be a sign of mastoiditis. If there will be pus draining from the ear and discharge which is reported for less than 2 weeks or 14 days, that is an acute ear infection. Okay, and with the ear pain, however, if there will be draining of pus of more than 2 weeks or 14 days, that's a chronic ear infection. If there's no ear pain and no pus draining from the ear infection okay no ear infection for our treatment for mastoiditis acute ear infection and chronic ear infection if the first dose of your appropriate antibiotic if the first dose of paracetamol then refer urgently to the hospital if ever for acute ear infection give antibiotics for five days give paracetamol for pain and dry ear by wicking and file up in five days about chronic ear infection dry by wicking file up in five days no ear infection no additional treatment is necessary then we go now to part six you assess the child for malnutrition and anemia okay look and feel for visible signs of wasting severe wasting look for edema of both feet Look for palmar pallor. If ever there will be present, is it severe palmar pallor or some palmar pallor? Then determine uh, the weight for age. So you have to compare the child's weight with that of the standard growth chart and look for the weight for age category. Then now he assess the case would the case fall on the pink the yellow or the green okay or the white okay so visible pink there will be visible severe wasting or edema of both feet or severe palmar pallor that would be severe malnutrition or severe anemia some palmar pallor or very low weight for age that's anemia or very low weight not very low weight for age and no other signs of malnutrition, no anemia, and not, not very low weight. So how do you treat? Okay, you treat often according to row, uh, especially for the severe malnutrition or anemia. Give your vitamin A still, you have to give your vitamin A, then refer the case immediately to the hospital. If anemia are very low weight only, assess the child's feeding, you do study them. We can ask for the feeding diary, counsel the mother on feeding. If there's feeding problem, you follow up, you try to look for solutions and follow up in five days and look for improvements. If pallor, give iron or you may consider giving antihelmintics like your mebendazole or albendazole. If the child is more than one year and has not been given a dose in the previous six months, then you ask the child to follow up in 14 days or 2 weeks. If you have a low weight for age, give vitamin A 
and follow up in 30 days. Then advise the mother when they should return. Okay. For no anemia and not very low weight, if the child is less than 2 years, assess the child's feeding and counsel the mother on feeding. If, the, if there's feeding problem, you try to look for the solution, advise them, and follow up in 5 days. Advise the mother when to return. Okay. So, part 7 is to check for possible HIV infection. Okay. So, I'll just have uh, uh, copied what is written on the on the PDF file. Okay. Use this chart if the child is not involved in HIV care. Okay. You ask as the mother or child has an HIV test. If yes, this decide HIV status. If the mother's positive or negative, if the child has virological uh, test positive or negative or serological positive or negative, if the child is HIV positive and the child is negative or unknown, ask, was the child breastfeeding? Because HIV can be transferred to maternal milk, the time or six weeks before the test. Is the child feeding now, breastfeeding now? If breastfeeding us, is the mother and child on antiretroviral drug prophylaxis? If no, then test mother and child status if unknown. Test the mother, then mother HIV positive and the child status unknown, then just test the child. So first test the mother if the status are both unknown. If ever the status of the mother is known, then check test the child. So, now you classify HIV status. So, it can be yellow, confirm HIV infection, positive virological test in a child, or positive serological test in a child 18 months old or older. So, what we do, initiate an initial uh, antiretroviral therapy treatment and HIV care, give cotrimoxazole prophylaxis, okay, Assess the child's feeding and provide appropriate counseling for the mother. Advise the mother on how on home care. Assess or refer for TB assessment and isoniazid preventive therapy or IPT. And follow up regularly as per national guidelines. If it is yeah, again, HIV exposed, mother HIV positive and negative uh, positive and negative virological te uh, test in a breastfeeding child or only stopped less than six weeks ago or the mother is HIV positive and the child is not yet labeled or positive serological test in a child less than 18 months old so that would now be labeled as yellow HIV exposed so what do we do? We give cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. You start or continue ARV prophylaxis as recommended. Do virological tests to confirm HIV status. Assess the child's feeding and provide appropriate counseling to the mother. And advise the mother on home care. Follow up regularly as per national guidelines. If ever negative HIV test in mother or child, then if the patient goes to green, HIV infection unlikely, then treat cancer and follow up existing infections. Let's proceed to part 8. Check the child's immunization status. Well, for this part, any child not ill enough to be admitted to a hospital can be given the appropriate immunization. Okay? So this is the, the, the schedule for immunization in any age group. Okay? So they will have the age and the uh, vaccines that will be recommended. At birth, you give your BCG and your uh, first dose of HEPA B, that's for WHO. And that's for our country, but still with this recommendation at six weeks, you can give your DPT one, 
OPV, the first dose, and the first dose of your Hepa B. And after 10 weeks or 6 weeks, 4 weeks apart, you can give your second dose of your DPT, polio, and Hepa B. Then, at 14 weeks, you can give your DPT, OPV, and the third dose of your Hepa B. So, in this uh, schedule, see, it's quite different from our uh, recommendation in our country because this is WHO recommendation. Okay. In our country, you can give BCG and the first dose of hepatitis B at birth. And at six weeks, you can give your first dose, second dose of your hepatitis B, and the third, the third dose can be given at six months of age. Okay, so at 24 weeks. Okay, so it's quite different. But what is uh, common would be the first, second, and third dose of your DPT and your OPVs. Then at nine months, you can give your So, in here, do not give BCG to a child known to have AIDS. So, these are your notes. Infants born to mother with TB disease, do not give BCG first. Why? Because you can have your accelerated BCG reaction. Instead, you give your IPT or isonitive preventive therapy for 3 months. And if ever, then give, do your skin test if skin test is negative then you can give your BCG just to prevent the BCG accelerated reaction okay do not give DPT2 or DPT3 to a child who had okay convulsion or shock within three days of the most recent dose okay if they have the reaction in the first doses of your DPT first dose of your DPT then do not attempt to give the second and the third dose. Do not give DPT to a child with recurrent convulsions. Okay, so those who have uh, convulsions or epilepsy or other active neurological disease of the central nervous system. However, there is no contraindication to immunization of a sick child if the child is well enough to go home. So for minor ailments, you can vaccinate. The second dose of measles vaccine may be given at any opportunistic moment during a periodic supplementary immunization activities as early as one month following the first dose. This is a good note. So you can give the second dose. As usually you have to give two doses of your measles. Okay. You can give the measles then the MR. Then however you can give the second dose of measles vaccine after as early as one month after the first dose then for HIV positive infants and patrium neonates who have received three primary vaccine doses before the 12 months of age may benefit from a booster dose in the second year of life okay for rotavirus vaccine, it is given to children selected areas due to their limited supply and cost. Okay? The rota vaccine now in the market has two brands. One brand is given at a two dose schedule and another brand is given in a three dose schedule. Your PCV or your pneumococcal conjugate vaccine is given to children in selected areas only due to limited supply and cost. Now, always check the vitamin A status of your child or your patient. Okay, you can give the first dose of 6 months or above, subsequent doses every 6 months up to age of 59 months or 5 years old. Okay? All children at six months should receive and up should receive hundred thousand units of vitamin A. Then they should receive two hundred thousand of vitamin A every six months up to age fifty nine. So it means six to twelve months, hundred thousand single dose. Then one year to uh, five years old, you can give two hundred thousand. Then one year to to five years that could be given every six months up to age 59 months.
Philippines. So, reminder, for routine with dewarming, every child should be given mebendazole or albendazole every 6 months of age of 1 year. Okay. Then, you should record the dose of the child's, the child's ch card for oral health. Advise the mother to bring the child to a dentist every six months for dental checkup starting okay, from age of six months. So at six months old, you now can ask for a dental visit every six months. Okay? For deworming, uh, you can give every six months starting at one year old. So now you assess other problems. Make sure the child with any general danger sign is referred after the first dose of appropriate antibiotic and other urgent treatments like uh, preventing hypoglycemia. Treat all children with a general danger sign to prevent low blood sugar. However, for skin infections, allergies, or other immunological problems like swollen neck glands, heart disease, endocrine abnormalities, and malignancy, so you must also assess for such. So you can observe other problems during assessment, identify and treat any other problem according to your training, experience, and health center policy, or refer the child for any other problem you cannot manage in your health center okay it's for hiv testing and interpreting results so you can would like to review this this chart okay so this is available just later on post on it and read on it okay and move on then follow-up care give follow-up care for acute conditions Care for the child returns to her follow-up using all boxes that match the child's previous specification. If the child is sending new problem assessed, classify and treat the new problem as on the assess and classify chart. Okay. So for pneumonia, you might ask the child to follow up after three days, check the child for general danger signs again, assess the child for cough and difficulty of breathing. So from the initial assessment, now you reassess is the child breathing slower? Is there still chest in drawing? Is there, is there less fever now? Or is the child eating better? Then the assessment and reclassify to the your, to your child. So you treat any danger signs or try to refer urgently again to the hospital if ever there will be development of such, such signs. Okay? If chest in drawing and or breathing rate, fever and eating are the same or worse, then refer urgently to the hospital. However, is if breathing is now becomes low, slower, no chest in drawing or less fever and eating better, then you advise to complete five days of the antibiotic. Or however, follow up care for persistent diarrhea after five days of follow up. Yes, now, ask, has the diarrhea stopped or still how many stools is the child having per day? So, you treat if the diarrhea has not stopped, child is having three or more loose stools per day, do a full reassessment of the child, treat for dehydration if present, then refer to the hospital for workup and management. If the diarrhea has stopped, okay, and the child less with will be having less three stools per day. Tell the mother to follow up the usual feeding recommendation for the child's age. If ever follow up for a case of blood stools or dysentery after three days, assess the child for diarrhea, then you assess and classify, uh, go to the assess and classify chart, as now, is there any improvement, improvement like fewer stools? lesser blood in the stool is there less fever less abdominal pain or is the child eating better so so you treat now if ever you find some signs like if the child is dehydrated then treat the dehydration rehydrate the child if the number of stools the amount of stools fever abdominal pain or eating are worse or the same then 
change to the second line oral antibiotic recommended for this entity that would be we call Glymoxazole give it for 5 days advise the magic to return in 3 days and if you don't have the second line antibiotic to refer to the hospital exception for the second line if the child is less than 12 months old or was dehydrated on the first visit or if the child had measles within the last three months then if all of these are present then refer the child to the hospital however if the, there will be fewer stools less blood in the stools less fever less abdominal pain and this is a improved appetite then continue giving your ciprofloxacin until it is finished okay ensure that the mother understand the oral rehydration method fully and that she also understand the need for an extra meal each day for a week okay so that, that your patient nutrition wise can now catch up for malaria follow up care for malaria if fever persists after three days the full reassessment of the child then you again assess and classify go to the assess and classify chart do not repeat the rapid diagnostic test it was if it was positive on the initial visit and then you treat that the child has any danger signs like your, your stiff neck it has a very severe febrile disease okay if the child has any other cause of fever other than malaria then provide the appropriate treatment if there's no other apparent cause of fever if the fever has been present for seven days then refer for assessment do microscopy to look for malaria parasites. If parasites are present, the child has finished a full course of the first line anti-malarial. Then give the second line anti-malarial if available or refer the patient to the hospital. If there's a, no other apparent cause or fever or fever and you do not have any microscopy to check your parasite, then it, it would be better and prudent to refer the child to the hospital. So, for fever, no malaria, if fever persists for more than 3 days or after 3 days, do a full reassessment, then refer again to the assess and classify chart, then repeat the malaria test. If ever in the initial test there is no malaria. So, treat if the child has any danger signs like your stiff neck, then treat it as a very severe febrile disease. If the child has positive malaria test now, then give the first oral first time oral malaria anti-malaria then advise the mother to return in three days if the fever persists if the child has any other cause of fever other than malaria then provide treatment if there's no other apparent cause of fever okay the fever has been present for seven days then refer for assessment how about if the child has measles with eye or mouth complications, gum or mouth ulcer or trash, then you ask them to follow up then after 3 days look for the presence of conjunctivitis or red eyes and pus draining from the eyes. Look at mouth ulcers or white patches in the mouth or like your trash and smell the mouth for any putrid or fall that means there can be exudates okay, or past uh, formation so to treat eye infection if ever there will be now a uh, purulent discharge or past draining from the eye ask the mother to describe how she has treated the eye infection first because you have to know if the mother really understood the, your first instruction and did the application correctly if the treatment has been correct then refer the patient to the hospital if, however if the treatment has not been correct then teach the mother the correct treatment it would be better the, the uh, uh, you instruct the mother and show the mother and now you uh, ask the mother to do it in front of you to do the procedure in front of you okay then if the pus is gone but redness remains continue your current treatment or if no pus or redness then they stop the treatment now for to treat oral ulcers now the oral ulcers are worse or there's been foul smell from the mouth refer to the hospital 
If multiple shares are the same or better, then continue the half strength change on violet for a total of 5 days. So for this is the recommendation for the treatment for oral crush. A crush is worse. Check that treatment is being given correctly. If the child has problems with swallowing, refer the patient to the hospital for the risk of dehydration and malnutrition. If the crush is the same or better, then the child is feeding well. Continue nystatin for 3, total of 7 days. For ear infection, after 5 days, reassess for ear problem. Then you look at the assess and classify chart. Make sure now the child's temperature. So if there is tender swelling behind the ear, meaning there will be uh, mastoiditis or the presence of high fever like 38 degrees, 38.5 and above, refer urgently to the hospital. If there is a ear infection, if the ear or discharge persists, treat with 5 more days of the anti same antibiotics, then continue weakening to the other ear, then you ask them to follow up after 5 days. If, however, if no ear pain or discharge is, is noted, then praise the mother for careful treatment. If she has not yet finished the 5 days of antibiotics, tell her to use all of it before stopping. For cases of chronic ear infection, check that the mother is weakening the ear correctly and giving quinolone drops three times a day. Encourage her to continue. Now for feeding problem. After five days, we assess feeding. Okay, you see the questions the counsel the mother chart as about feeding problems found on the initial visit. Then the counsel the mother about a new or continue continuing feeding problems. If you counsel the mother to make significant changes in feeding, ask her to bring the child back again and reassess. Okay? Always reassess. If the child is classified as moderate acute malnutrition, ask the mother to return after 30 days after the initial visit to measure the child's weight for height or length, then also measure the mid-upper arm circumference or move. For follow-up care for anemia, then after 14 days, after giving iron, advise the mother to return for 14 days for more iron. Continue giving iron every 14 days for 2 months. Okay. So, that just means that you just give the mother uh, enough stock to last for 14 days so that they will come back to you. Then, give them another stock for another 14 days. So, do this uh, routine for two months so that means there will be two months of supplementation for iron. Okay. For uncomplicated severe acute malnutrition after 14 days of during regular follow-up, do a full assessment of the child. So you refer this assess and classify chart. Assess the child with the same measurements like your weight for height or length uh, or mid upper arm circumference or your MOA as on the initial visit. Check for edema of both feet. So that could be a danger sign. Check the child's appetite by offering ready to use therapeutic food in, if the child is 6 months or older. Okay. So what do you do? How do you treat? If the child has complicated severe acute malnutrition, meaning your uh, weight for height or length is less than negative 3. Okay, this is severe acute malnutrition. The Z-score is less than negative 3, or the MOAC is less than 150 mm, or edema on presence of edema on both feet, and has developed a medical complication or edema, or first the, the appetite test, then refer urgently to the hospital. However, if the child has uncomplicated severe malnutrition, the WFL is less than negative 3 Z score or the MUAC is less than 115 or edema or of both feet but no medical complication and passes the appetite test meaning the, the child ate what you offered counsel the mother encourage the hair to continue with appropriate uh, ready to uh, to use uh, food okay feeding as the mother to return again in after two weeks. If the child has moderate acute malnutrition, so meaning your WF 
or L is will be between negative 3 to negative 2 Z scores or MOAP is between 115 and 125 millimeter millimeters then advise the mother to continue on the RUTF counsel her to start other foods according to the age appropriate feeding recommendation so you look at the counsel the mother chart tell her to return again in two weeks continue to see the child every 14 days until the child's WF or L is around minus 2 Z scores okay, or more and the MOAC is 125 mm or more so, so uh, uh, the cutoff would be 115 okay, and minus 3 Z scores if the child has no acute malnutrition your WF WF, uh, WF H or L is negative two Z scores or more or higher or the MUAC is 125 millimeter or more place the mother stop the RUTF and counsel her about the age appropriate feeding recommendation okay, by looking at the counsel of the mother child so the follow up care for the moderate acute malnutrition then after 30 days of follow-up you assess the child using the same measurement as you have used before your weight for height or length or your mid upper arm circumference which was used in the initial visit if you use w f h or l then weigh the child measure the height or length and determine if your w f h or l if MOAC used a MOAC measuring tape then check the child for edema of both feet then you reassess the feeding then uh, your question should go uh, with which should be found in the council the mother chart okay so if the child is no longer classified as moderate acute malnutrition meaning the child improved then you praise the mother and encourage her to continue if the child is still classified as moderate acute malnutrition, counsel their mother again about any feeding problems and look for it. Then ask the mother to return again after a month. Continue this child monthly to see the child monthly until the child is feeding well and gaining weight regularly or his or her weight for height or length is at negative 2 Z scores or more or the MUAC is 125 mm or more however there's an exception if you do not think that feeding will improve or if the child has lost weight or or his or her MUAC has diminished then by no means refer the child how about uh, how to give follow-up care for HIV exposed and infected child so these are given to HIV exposed, confirmed HIV infection not on ART and confirmed HIV infection on ART. Please for these topics, uh, I would uh, hopefully you be able to take hold of the PDF file of IMCI coming from the WHO. It can be uh, found in pages 31 and 32 of your IMCI handbook. In WHO and continue assess the child for appetite all children ages aged six months or more with a severe acute malnutrition with the presence of edema of both feet or your weight for height or length is less than negative three Z scores or the MOAP is less than 115 no medical complications should be as with no medical complication should be assessed for appetite if appetite is assessed on the initial visit and at each follow-up visit to the health facility arrange a quiet corner where the child and the mother can take their time to get accustomed to eating the RUTF especially the child eats the RUTF portion in 30 minutes RUTF means ready to use food then explain to the mother the purpose of assessing the child's appetite what is the ready to use therapeutic food okay how to give your RUTF first 
This is the procedure. Wash the hands before giving the ready to eat therapeutic food. Okay, ready. Sit with the child on the lap and gently over the child your RUTF to eat. Encourage the, the child to eat the RUTF without feeding by force. Then, offer plenty of clean water to drink from a cup when the child is eating the RUTF. Okay, again, RUTF stands for Ready to Use Therapeutic Food. Offer appropriate amount of RUTF to the child to eat. Then usually we, they should be able to consume it in within 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, check if the child was able to finish or not able to finish the amount of RUTF given and decide. If the child is able to finish it, at least one third of a packet of RUTF portion is around 92 grams or teaspoons from a pot within 30 minutes. Or will the child not able to eat one third of a packet of RUTF portion around 92 grams or teaspoons from a pot within 30 minutes? Okay. Assess the child if the child is less than 2 years old, has moderate acute malnutrition or anemia, confirm HIV infection or HIV exposed, ask the questions about the child's use of feeding and feeding during the Ill his illness. Compare the mother's answer to the feeding recommendation for child's age. Ask the mother, how are you feeding your child? Ask how, how are you feeding your child? Is the child receiving any breast milk? Again, ask how many times during the day and also ask do you breastfeed during the night. Okay. Does the child take any other food or fluid? If so, what food or fluids? How many times per day? What do you use to feed the child? If moderate acute malnutrition or if a child with confirmed HIV infection fails to gain weight or loses weight between monthly measurements, ask How large are the servings? Does the child receive his own serving? Who feeds the child and how? What foods are available in the home? During this illness, has the child feeding changed? If yes, please describe how. Okay. In addition, for HIV exposed child, if the mother and child are on ARV treatment or prophylaxis and the child breastfeeding, then ask, do you take ARV drugs or do you take all doses? Miss, those do not take any medication. Does a child take ARV drugs? Okay. Does he or she take all doses, may miss doses, or does not take medication? If the child is breastfeeding, ask what milk are you giving? How many times during the day or night and night? How much is giving at each feed? How are you preparing the milk? So let the mother demonstrate or explain how a, how a feed is prepared and how is it given to the infant. Are you giving any breast milk at all? Are you able to get new supplies of milk before you run out? How is the milk being given? Is it through a cup or a bottle? How are you cleaning the feeding utensils? So these are very important questions. Then assess the child's feeding. Assess the child the feeding if child is less than two years old, has moderate acute malnutrition, anemia, confirmed HIV infection, or is HIV exposed. Ask questions about the child's unusual feeding and feeding during this illness. Ask how are you feeding your child? If the child is receiving any breast milk, ask how many times during the day? How do you also breastfeed during the night? Does the child take any food or fluids? What food or fluids? How many times a day? What do you use to feed the child? So this is your feeding recommendations for all children during sickness and health and including HIV exposed children on ARV prophylaxis. So for newborn birth up to one week, immediately after birth, put your baby in the skin to skin contact with you, allow your baby to take the breast within the first hour, give your baby colostrum, the first yellowish thick milk. It protects the baby from many illnesses.
Breastfeed day and night, as often as your baby wants, at least 8 times in 24 hours. Frequent feeding produces more milk. If your baby is small, feed at least every 2 to 3 hours. Wake the baby for feeding after 3 hours if the baby does not wake himself. Not give other foods or fluids. Breast milk is all what your baby needs. This is especially important for each infants of HIV positive mothers. Mixed feeding increases the risk of HIV mother to child transmission when compared to exclusive breastfeeding. At 1 to 6 months, breastfeed as often as your child wants. Look for signs of hunger, such as beginning to fast, sucking fingers, or moving lips. Breastfeed day and night whenever your baby wants at least 8 times in 24 hours. Frequent feeding produces more milk. Do not give other foods or fluids. Breast milk is all your baby needs. For 6 months to 9 months, breastfeed as often as your child wants. Give thick porridge or well-mashed food including animal source. Foods and vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. Start by giving 2 to 3 tablespoons of food. Gradually increase to 1 half cup because 1 cup is around 250 ml. Give 2 to, two, 2 to 3 meals each day. Offer 1 to 2 snacks each day between meals when the child seems 9 to 12 months, breastfeed as often as your child wants. Also give variety of mash or finely chopped family food, including animal source foods and vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. Give half cup of each meal. Okay. Give 3 to 4 meals at each day. Offer 1 to 2 snacks between meals. The child will eat if hungry. For snacks, give small chewable items that the child can hold. Let your child try to eat the snack but provide help if needed. For 12 months to 2 years, breastfeed as often as your child wants. Also give a variety of mash or funny chop family food including animal source foods and vitamin A, rich fruits and vegetables. Give around 3 4 cup of each meal. Give to 3 4 to 4 meals a day. Offer 1 to 2 snacks between meals. Continue to feed your child slowly patiently, encourage, but do not force your child to eat. For 2 years and older, give a variety of family foods to your child, including animal sources and vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. Now, you can give at least 1 cup full of each meal. Give 3 to 4 meals each day. Offer 1 to 2 snacks between meals. However, if your child refuses a new food, offer taste several times. Show, this is very important, show that you like the food and be patient. Talk with your child during a meal and keep eye contact. Done with, with, with IMCI1, the tacos, uh, Children 2 months to 5 years old and even uh, nutrition and, and feeding recommendations. So, maraming po salamat. Again, uh, thank you again. So, you can always find it in my YouTube channel. Please uh, click the subscribe button and the notification ba uh, bell. And you can please share this video so that many will learn. Thank you very much.